word. Father, we pray that you open up the minds of your people, that you open up their spirits to receive the revelation that you want to give today. Father, we just thank you for your presence and your manifestation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So one I really want to focus on is verse 3. We're going to go through this. But verse 3 says, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. If I was going to use for a thought today, it would be, do you have an invitation? Do you have an invitation? The disciples, it opens up with the disciples asking Jesus a question. It was basically challenging him. Because they know who he is, supposedly the Messiah, the Son of God. But they're basically asking a question to challenge him, to make him think, to make him come up with an answer that would satisfy their needs. Um, because they're basically trying to position themselves to make sure that what they're doing and following him is going to esteem them in the kingdom. So what you missed in that is that what's actually driving that conversation is an underlying spirit of pride. The disciples need to have Jesus affirm within themselves that they're important. Because they've been following him and they gave up everything uh, that they had to follow him. They need Jesus to affirm within themselves, as we talked last week. Oftentimes we look for outside external factors to affirm who we believe we are. Mm -hmm. You have to keep in mind, these disciples have been following Jesus for quite a while. And so now they're at the point to where they want to ask him, who is the greatest or who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because they want him to affirm their positioning with him not only on earth but also in the kingdom to come. Mm -hmm. Jesus in turn has always been known to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. He uses parables, he uses storylines, he uses uh, real life things to actually teach. He doesn't always give you the answer that you're looking for but rather he, he teaches you through life's experiences and he teaches you through examples. So Jesus, instead of answering the question that they asked him, what he does is he asks the little child to come to him, right? And so after that, he set him in the midst of them, and verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So they're looking for Jesus to answer their question as far as affirming who they really are to him on earth as well as what they will be in the kingdom. Jesus and not so many words says, do you even know you're going? Because he says, except you be converted, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. So they're focused on what their position is going to be. And Jesus is focusing on, are you going to be there? This is the thing that a lot of us in this earth dimension, we get stuck on because, especially those of us that pastor, we have titles, we have positions, we begin to think that we're important because we hear from God, we lead his people, so we begin to think that we're important. So once we begin to think that we're important, then we get puffed up within ourselves and pride begins to speak to the point to where all of a sudden we feel like things that we used to do for God and the blessings that we used to get in return and the things that his people used to do for us because we used to feed them the word, all of a sudden those things that we used to consider privileges and used to consider honor and used to be humbled, all of a sudden we begin to feel like we're entitled to receive those things. To where now we're prideful to not only should you bring me some water, but you also should, I should be the first in line to eat. You should carry my Bible. You should make sure I got everything I need because I'm giving you the word. That in itself wouldn't be that big a deal because most people by nature, if you're taking care of them, if you're feeding them, they will want to do those things. Where it becomes an issue is where you feel like you're entitled to it. Because entitlement is an offspring of pride. You only feel entitled to something once you have a spirit of pride to where you feel like it's owed to you. So now you're not just doing it because God has called you to. You're doing it now because you feel like the rewards you receive in return, that they're owed to you. And mm -hmm. that people are obligated to take care of you. Because of a calling that you say that God has placed on your life. So God, in turn, Jesus, in turn, challenges them with another question when he basically says, do you have an invitation? Do you even know if you're going to be there? They want to know their position. They want to know that, you know, him to affirm that they're important, that they're significant. And he's saying to them, do you even know that you're going to be there? Mm. 
You're concerned on what your position is be, is going to be. I'm concerned if you if you're even gonna make it. Hmm. So the focus then becomes on do we have an invitation? Because there's nothing like crashing a party, <laughs> right? Yeah. Those of us that have lived that lifestyle years ago, we used to go to parties that we know we weren't invited to, and we intentionally show up late, and we intentionally show up and make a grand entrance, we make all sort of noise, make a ruckus, you know, we call ourselves, you know, crashing that particular party. The thing with the kingdom of heaven, you're not going to be able to crash that party. <laughs> so you're not just going to show up without an invitation. So Jesus, in turn, is re-emphasizing the significance of having that invitation. And except you come unto me as a child and be converted, you're not going to receive the invitation. Why? Because children, they do what you ask them to do, but they do it without feeling significant. They don't feel like it's something that they're entitled to do. They don't feel like it's something that you owe them. Now, that then becomes a point of scrutiny in the 21st century because you have teachers that are actually teaching children that their parents are obligated to do this. They're obligated to do that. They're obligated to get you the best clothes. They're obligated to get you the best you know, equipment, the best things. You're, they're obligated to get you the PlayStation 4 when it drops or the Xbox One. If they love you, they will give you those things. As if the things is what's going to affirm the relationship between the mother and the son or the father and the daughter or the parent and the, 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 the sibling or the offspring dynamic as if those things are going to affirm them. And then you look in the videos, and all of a sudden you see people bling bling, and they got the necklaces, they got the fat whips, they got the big houses. Now all of a sudden you work your nine to five job, making eight to ten dollars an hour. Now all of a sudden you feel inferior because you don't have those things to affirm you as a person. No longer is it good enough for you to be able to just bring the bacon home and put it on the table so your family can eat. Because you don't have those things that you see every day, all of a sudden you begin to feel inferior because those things is what has become in society the definition of a person, the right. definition of success. If you don't have things, then you're not successful. If you don't have things, then you are beneath the person that does, or you are inferior to the 1% of Americans that are wealthy if you don't have things. But what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand is everything in, the, in this world is not significant if you don't have an invitation. Hmm. You have to have an invitation. You're not just going to get into heaven just because you come to church. You're not just going to get into heaven just because you have a good relationship with your pastor if you're fortunate to have one. Hmm. You're not just going to get into the kingdom just because you read your Bible. You have to have an invitation. Hmm. Hmm. It's not something that's just going to be given to you. Now, the right to receive the invitation was something that was granted when he hung on the cross on Calvary because the blood of Jesus covers your sin and your iniquity. But that is where it stops. It actually gives you the right to receive the invitation, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you are going to receive that invitation. Hmm. It puts you in alignment to receive it, but it doesn't guarantee that you will receive that invitation. That invitation comes from the way we live our lifestyle. That right. gets our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's when we get on the guest list for the kingdom. If our name is not on that guest list, then when the invitations go out, we are not going to receive an invitation. It's just as if someone was getting married. And they sit down and they derive a list of everybody they want to invite. If your name is not on that list, when they're paying their money to send out invitations, if your name is not on that guest list, you will not receive an invitation to the wedding. It's the same way with the kingdom. If your lifestyle doesn't line up to a point to where it puts you on the heavenly guest list, when the invitation comes to be welcomed into the kingdom, you're not going to receive that invitation. And so this is why it's significant that not only do we understand who we serve, but we understand why we serve, and we understand the significance of serving. Then verse 4 says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as his little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
So here we go again. They want to know who's, the, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus asked a child to come unto him. And what they don't understand when he did that, he was actually answering their question without giving any words. Mm -hmm. Because a, a child, if you tell a child to do something, they will do it because of your position, because of your authority over who they are. You being their parent, you have certain authority over your child who maybe the teacher does not have. So if you say one thing to your child, it's going to make your, motivate your child to listen to what you say. Whereas your, the teacher doesn't necessarily have the same authority as the parent. So it doesn't carry as much weight. What Jesus is saying is that you come unto me as a child. And you understand the authority that I have, being the Son of God, and that what the Heavenly Father has, being the Sovereign God, then what you will lack is the understanding that what they tell me to do, I must do it. Not second guess what I'm being told by my Creator or by my Savior, but the mere fact that they told me to do it, then I should obey what they're telling me to do because of the authority that they carry. Just like as our children were to come to us and try to second guess what we tell them to do, there will be consequence for that. That's right. There will be punishment. Yes. There will be discipline. There will be groundings. Mm -hmm. There will be certain consequences that come. So when God tells us to do something and we second guess it or we don't do it, there's consequences. In other words, just like that child gets in trouble with the parent, we as God's children get in trouble when we second guess or disobey what he tells us to do. Mm -hmm. So if we don't do what God tells us to do, there's a consequence that we have to deal with. And oftentimes that consequence is the very trouble that we run into that drives us back to him. Because he loves us enough to where he wants to give us a second chance to receive that invitation, but he'll send trouble to realign us back in the right position that we should be in. Oftentimes when blessing comes, we begin to feel like we're doing this, we're great, we're awesome, we're, we're righteous. And then what we don't understand is we begin to walk in the spirit of self-righteousness because of that pride makes us feel like we're entitled to receive the blessings that God has for us because of the way we're living. Well, what we don't understand is, yes, there's certain promises that God has made in his word, but it's only his grace that allows yes. him to give us those blessings that we receive. Because for everything that we're doing right, I promise you, God can find 10 things that we're doing wrong. <laughs> I promise you he can. For every one thing that we feel like we know that we find in our lifestyle that we feel like we're doing wrong, I promise you God can find 100. For every one, he can find 100 things that we're doing wrong for every one thing that we think we're doing wrong. For every one flaw we believe we have, God can find a hundred flaws on top of that one that we believe we have. But what <laughs> his grace says is despite all your flaws, I'm still going to use you. Right. I'm still going to get the glory out of your life despite your flaws. Now our flaws, and this is where most ministries and most preachers missed it, our flaws, we believe, disqualifies us. Mm -hmm. In reality, our flaws is what qualifies us. Mm -hmm. Because when most people would give up on us because of our flaws, God looks down at us and says, I can use that. I can use that. You like the streets? You like running the streets? Hanging out on the streets? Most church folk will stay away from you. Yeah. God says, I can use that. Why? Because when I need you to go back out in those streets, you're not going to be scared to go out and compel all men to come. Whereas those that haven't ever lived the street life, they're going to be more hesitant or more reserved because they don't know what to expect out in the streets. But somebody who used to live the street life, they know exactly what they're going to confront. They know exactly how to maneuver in those streets. And so God says, I am yet going to get the glory out of their life. I can use that. And so a lot of times we in position or we in leadership, we feel like because maybe God took us a different way that we're better than those that took a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. 
or those that enjoy having fun out in the streets or kicking it out in the streets. And what we don't understand is maybe we have a different call. Mm. Maybe my calling didn't require me to be out in the streets. Right. Maybe my calling required me to know how to lead and know how to influence. Whereas when God gets ready to get the evangelists in order, yes, they have to be prepared to go out. And so what better way to prepare an evangelist or a missionary to go back out in the streets and compel them to come than to have them going through their preparation in the street to where they're in the street getting high, they're in the street getting drunk, they're in the street in all type of unholy, ungodly relationships. But when God says, I can use that, he knows that you'll be able to empathize. You'll be able to feel the pain of somebody who's addicted to drugs. You'll be able to feel yes. the pain yes. of somebody who's addicted to alcohol. You'll be able to feel the burden of someone who's in a relationship because they don't know who they are. So they're in a relationship that is ungodly, not because they willfully want to be in that relationship, but because somebody hurt them to the point to where they don't really understand who they are. So much rather than deal with this pain again, I will cut off that gender or that relationship that has put me in the place to where I don't want to be hurt anymore. It's not that I don't like men or it's not that I don't like women. I just don't like being hurt. So before That's right. I put myself in a position to be hurt again, I will cut that gender off that hurt me. And then all of a sudden I find myself dealing with an identity crisis, trying to be something that God never called me to be, not because that is something that I prefer. I just don't want to be hurt. I can protect myself against women if I'm a female. I know how they think. I know how they maneuver. I don't know how a man thinks. I don't know how a man operates. So I'm vulnerable to a man. If I am a man, I know how men think. Right. So I don't face the same vulnerability being involved with a man than being involved with a female. I don't know how women think. So if I get in a relationship with a, uh, with a woman and I'm a man and I'm accustomed to being hurt and I'm trying to protect myself from being hurt, I'll get in that relationship with the man because I know how men think. I know the warning signs. With the female, I don't know how women think. So I'm vulnerable to go through that pain again just because I don't know if you really love me or if you're trying to use me and take me through the same hell I went through with the last person I was with. Right. So the first thing I would do was cut off that gender that hurt me. And I would cut off that gender that hurt me not because I prefer to be a homosexual, not because because I prefer to be a lesbian, I prefer to be gay, but I just prefer not to be hurt. It's just like when you're going through the situation with a parent that wasn't in your life when you wanted them in your life. You grow up without that parent because that pain that that parent caused you to go through simply by the way they either mistreated you, abused you, or neglected you. So you go through life not wanting to be involved with that parent. So all of a sudden you start cleaving to the one parent that you have because yes. that's what's familiar to you and that's what you're comfortable with. But you distance yourself from the parent that hurts you. It's the same situation with a person's sexuality. It's all of a sudden because a certain gender hurts you, you begin to cleave to the gender that didn't hurt you and you begin to distance yourself from the one that did. For me, it's much easier for yes. me to deal with life without that gender than to deal with life with that pain. Right. And it's the same situation with that parent. Just like a child would disown a parent, as a person dealing with their sexuality, we will disown that gender because we don't want to be hurt. And then we look for all type of reasons to justify why we're disowning that gender because I'm gay, because I'm lesbian, because I'm a homosexual, because I don't like women, I don't like girls, or I don't like men. It has nothing to do with that. It really has to do with the fact that I don't like pain. I don't like right. hurting. And because I don't want to hurt anymore, I won't deal with you anymore. Right. And so what happens is we get it twisted. We start dealing and let the enemy get in our ear and say that all men are like this or all women are like that. Right. If you get in another relationship with a female, and I don't know why I'm going this way, oh Lord, I need you to go. I need you to direct me, but I don't know why I'm going this way. But it, 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 the enemy gets in our ear and 
and we begin to listen to what he's saying to where all men cheat. All women, they all they want is your money. And so we begin to listen to him to the point to where all of a sudden we stop listening to what God is saying. Yes. Because what the enemy is saying reinforces what we already believe based on the pain we experience. And because he's saying things that sounds right to us based on our personal experience, we'll cling more to what he's saying than what God is saying. God is saying, I have someone prepared for you. I can bring you through just like I brought you out of that relationship. Just because I brought you out of that hell and that misery, I have prepared somebody for you that can be that much more greater in your life, that can sow into your life. Yes. And show you the kind of love that you should have received as being one of my children. When we will listen to the enemy and say, all men are like that. All women cheat. All men are dogs. And then we begin to separate ourselves from the blessing that God really has for us because of our pain. And so we never really walk in the blessing and the promise that God really has for us because we don't want to be hurt. It's not that we don't, we don't like a particular gender. We just don't like pain. Right. And if we tell the truth, most of us, and I'm going to have to finish the actual thought at a later time, but if we tell the truth, most of us that live those lifestyles or we come up with those mindsets, it's because at some point either somebody hurt us or somebody molested us. And because that was our first sexual experience, that's what feels right. Right. As a child, if your first sexual experience is with someone of the same sex, that's your first experience. So whenever you get involved with someone else of the opposite sex, it's not going to feel the same because that's the first experience that you had. Right. So this is what feels right. This over here, me trying to be with a female, doesn't feel right because when I was six years old, my uncle molested me. All right. So that was my first sexual experience, my first sexual encounter. And so because that was my first exposure to sex, now that I'm grown, I'm trying to deal with the relationship with a female it doesn't feel right. So let me go back to my place of comfortability, and that's men. And let me come up with all type of reasons to try to explain or justify why I'm in this sinful relationship. God made me this way. God didn't make you that way. God did not make you to lay down with the same sex when the Word specifically tells us not to do that. The thing is, we get tired of hurting, we get tired of pain, to the point to where it's easier for me to distance myself from that hurt and that pain. Or our first sexual encounter was that of a molestation by someone of the same sex. And so that's what feels comfortable. And until I get to the root of what makes me have those thoughts and those feelings, I will always feel like being homosexual or being gay or being a lesbian is right. Because I never dealt with what actually caused me to begin to have those feelings. I never dealt with that hurt. I never dealt with that pain. I buried it. Yes, God. I, I allowed it to go dormant to where I never dealt with it. I never dug it up. I never dealt with the reality that someone hurt me. I never dealt with the reality that someone took advantage of me. And so now I have an identity crisis trying to figure out who I should be with. And what God wants you to understand is as long as you're, you're trying to figure out who you should be with, you will always pick the wrong person because God has someone that he created for you. Right. That he wants to give you, but as long as you're trying to pick them, you will always pick the wrong person because you don't know the mind of God. So... You may pass that person, and I say this example all the time, you may pass that person flipping french fries at McDonald's <laughs> that always gives you the supersized fry, always <laughs> supersized your shake when you come to McDonald's, always has a pleasant smile for you every time you come. Right. You bypass that person because they flipping french fries right now, and they don't have the bling bling. They stay at the bus stop when they get off work, and when they're at work, they, all they're doing is flipping fries. All right. They go check the grease and empty out the grease and they put some fresh grease in there, and then they throw some more french fries in there, and all they're doing is flipping fries for eight hours. But you walk outside, and you see somebody in a parking lot 
with a with an S500 or S600 or they have, you know, a BMW 7 series or they have, you know, what your favorite car is in the parking lot and it looks like they ball and so that's what you're drawn to, the materialism aspect. Yes. Of it, and the pseudo quality of lifestyle that you can live with this person but what you don't understand is when you get with that person that they're hell on wheels because they know what they have is what drew your attention. Right. So they know once they ensnare you, they can treat you however they want to treat you because you're not going anywhere because the next man or the next woman ain't going to have what they had that drew your attention to them in the first place. Right. Now you're in a relationship 10, 12 years and you feel like you wasted time in your life. Then all of a sudden, one day you go to McDonald's and the guy who used to be flipping fries is no longer there. <laughs> So now you're wondering, what happened to Bobby? Well, Bobby now owns 15 McDonald's in this metropolitan area. All right. When he was flipping fries 12 years ago. You couldn't see that he liked you, and this is the person God had for you because he was flipping french fries. All right. Now he owns 15 McDonald's, and you're trying to find him because now it sinks in. He liked me. And so now you're asking God, where's my spouse? Your spouse was flipping french fries. <laughs> you missed it. Yeah. Right. Because he was flipping french fries. All right. Now he owns 15 McDonald's. But wow. now because you missed him, God blessed him because he still had the right spirit about what he was doing. So God blessed him with someone who appreciated those 12 years he was flipping french fries that helped him get to the destiny now to where he owns 15 McDonald's. And they're reaping the benefits that God actually had for you. Right. And on that, we're going to end. And this week, we're going to finish it next week. But Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you, oh God, for speaking to us. We thank you for the visitation. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to understand the significance of having an invitation and the significance of dealing with our hurts and our pains our significance of understanding that we don't know who we are without you. That we need you in order to, for you to define us and not for us to define ourselves because we are not the creator. We don't know what you created us to be. We don't know what it is that you have for us. And so oftentimes trying to figure it out, we make the wrong decisions. And so what we ask you to do is in those moments, that you continue to have your mercy upon us and your grace upon us, and that you continue to forgive us, continue to prepare us, Father, continue to give us the fresh revelation, the fresh insight to where we do encounter our mistakes, that we can dust ourselves off, get back up, get back in line, and effort to receive that invitation. Father God, there's no invitation more important than having an invitation to have eternal life with you. And we thank you, God, for the opportunity to even be here today to hear your word and to hear what you have said to us today. Father God, we thank you for these, our people. As we go to our various destinations, we pray, oh God, that you continue to minister to us, continue to teach us, continue to pour your love into us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.